Um, let me just ask a couple questions off the top, then we'll open it up. Let me first ask a question that puts the sovereign wealth funds in the broader global economic and financial context that you also spend a lot of your time working on. As your studies show, the sovereign wealth funds, almost by definition, are created by big surplus countries. And you, I think, uh, share the view, most of us do, that one of the big problems in the current global economy is that there are big imbalances that cause problems. And in particular, there are not very good mechanisms to lean on surplus countries to reduce the imbalances from their side. Now, you take basically a quite benign view about sovereign wealth funds and try to improve the international environment for them to function. But to be a little provocative, could one argue that in doing so, you are making it harder to achieve adjustment by those surplus countries? You're trying to facilitate the way in which they invest their money. You're blessing their use of this new vehicle to do it. You want the host countries to be more cooperative and, uh, and reduce restrictions that might impede their investment of that type. This is a time when some people are suggesting that the U.S. and other deficit countries actually put impediments on the inflow of foreign investment in order to reduce the incentive on the surplus countries to keep building up big surpluses. So taking this specific issue that you've worked on and putting it into the broader context that you've actually worked on all your life and continue to do so, the international adjustment process and all, are you sure the two are fully consistent? Uh, probably not. Uh, <laughs> I think the first thing to say is that uh, Fred carefully said almost all, right? Since he remembered that you know the United States has four hundred billion dollars worth of uh, sovereign, uh, external assets in our sovereign wealth fund. Surplus states. <laughs> well, okay. Uh, uh, no, that's surplus well. countries, uh, and and there are other countries that have uh, who have sovereign wealth funds uh, uh, who uh, who have deficits. In fact, the two Singapore funds are created when they were in deficit. Uh, but you're certainly right that most of the most of them have been, uh, most of the funding for sovereign wealth funds have come from external surpluses, and you're being uh, and you're being uh, fully consistent because when Larry Summers was here several years ago and gave his speech, uh, he said uh, foreign exchange countries with excess foreign exchange reserves should look for ways to invest those foreign exchange reserves in ways better than uh, just putting the T bills. Uh, you stood up and said, "Why are you going to make it? Why are you making it more attractive for them to build up their uh, build up their assets, uh, to uh, to build up their reserves?" So I think that is a, that is a a reasonable uh, question. Uh, it is certainly the case that they are the part of the symptom of of uh, of uh, of some aspects of the imbalances. Uh, I think that. Uh, but I'm not sure that they uh, are more the aftermath of that, if you want to put it that way, than than an incentive to do that, uh, to to, to uh, invest that way. Uh, and indeed, uh, you know, your comment about surplus states, uh, 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 in some sense, we all, whether we're in surplus or in deficit, as long as we have assets, whether we're individuals or countries. Uh, there is some case for diversifying our assets uh, outside our state or our country. Uh, uh, that's just good, good finance. Uh, and if you want to sort of close down that diversification motive, uh, which I think is on the long hand uh, helps us all, then you would uh, you would risk that. And I'm not so sure, even if you did want to uh, sort of use the sovereign wealth fund as a place to leverage um, or deleverage. Uh, on the global imbalances, uh, it strikes me as it probably would be. Uh, uh, you might you, you might be throwing out the baby with the bathwater, but it certainly is a. Uh, they're certainly connected. Let me ask you one other specific question, <laughs> and and then and then we'll open it up. Um, your conversation on the Santiago principles, and you then talked at the end about the need to strengthen them. Uh, you never used the word, but I think it's true, is it not? Santiago principles are voluntary. 
So, uh, would you, in your proposal to strengthen them, pursue them further, contemplate the desirability of making them mandatory in some sense, have a more binding international covenant that did commit the participants in a more binding way, would the obviously large effort that would be needed to achieve that be worth the candle in terms of assurance that would result then more certainly from the agreement? Um, a, is it desirable? B, is it feasible? Well, I think it's, uh, it's either, it's probably both desirable in some abstract sense and, uh, and even feasible. Uh, there are, and in fact, to some degree, it's already happening. So uh, one case is uh, actually Italy, uh, which in its investment law, which is a little on the uh, draconian side, if I may put it that way, does say that if, the, if, the, if it's a sovereign wealth fund and it comes from a country that adheres to these principles, I don't think it has a scorecard, so it probably should say something more about that, then it would be at least eligible for differential treatment. And I have said in the book, uh, I think to the annoyance of some of my friends at the Treasury Department, uh, uh, that I could imagine in the context of the CFIUS uh, process here in the United States, that if you had an investment that involved a sovereign wealth fund that scored well on uh, the Santiago principles, uh, that the process might, you might at least have a more accelerated process uh, uh, in terms of the review of an investment, right? Because there is a presumption that there's greater transparency, uh, at least about that. So you need to, you may still need to worry about the national security dimension of it, but uh, but there could be could be some presumptions. So I think in a in a loose way, you could move into that direction, and I could imagine as part of a broader framework agreement on cross-border governmental investments that some uh, teeth could be put into this uh, process. Uh, uh, and I hope in some sense that the funds um, see it that way, right? Uh, not, only that they, not only that they might get better treatment in their investments, uh, uh, but better treatment in all, in all dimensions, right, by pre preparing more. And I hope that one would hope that the ones who were at the, at the top of the scoreboard or the Santiago principal version of the scoreboard uh, would put pressure on those at the bottom because they all are, all are put in the same uh, the same uh, group. Uh, um, I uh, uh, since this is on the record and I don't like to embarrass people deliberately, uh, self conscious <laughs> except when I do. Um, there is a um, a major pension fund uh, who. Uh, of uh, another country that uh, is scored by us, who has, uh, uh, who has twice uh, engaged with me about the, how they are not a sovereign wealth fund. Uh, and, uh, and I should stop calling them a sovereign wealth fund. Now, uh, this is from a country that has a reputation of uh, sort of good governance. Uh, and so you would think that they were all in favor of good governance, since this stuff is all about good governance. Uh, but what is their fear? Their fear is that the United States Congress and the administration will sign a law that says sovereign wealth funds include government pension funds. Uh, they're in that world, and in, and in those circumstances, X, Y, and Z will apply uh, in terms of uh, the hurdles, at least, that you have to. Uh, so, uh, so there is a zero tension, right, about the people inside and outside. And my view is basically you want the good guys to pull up the bad guys. It'll be a very interesting. Uh, behavioral process to see to what extent uh, uh, this has gone on. You certainly saw it in some sense with respect to the audience. So the audience was at the bottom of the heap, right? It co-chaired. It co-chaired the uh, IWG, right? It has complied significantly, some might even say substantially, not totally, with the Sovereign Wealth Fund, uh, the Santiago Principles. They do a lot better on the Santiago principles of the scoreboard, so there's a big gap there. <laughs> May suggest another form of regulatory arbitrage going on. Um, 
but that clearly was an effect of the process, and it was perceived to be, and the audience had perceived it to be in its, its own interest to do this. Uh, and the interesting question was whether the six or seven, and there's another, Mabadal is also UAE uh, sovereign wealth fund, so it also has chosen to do that. But there are another four or five sovereign wealth funds in the UAE which are still down at the bottom. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see. So it's a bit like our worry about Alabama uh, uh, in this case. As a side point, I want to open it up now. As a side point, it is interesting that you've revealed now that you uh, have indeed been lobbied by some of the participants in your scoreboard. Um, I was amused by your comment on why some of the sovereign wealth funds have improved their standing. I wanted to ask how much of it was exogenous and how much was endogenous to your own process, but... Uh, well, that's, I can fair to say, I, um, I had the impression, uh, well, some of it's making sure I get it right, but, uh, <coughs> and at least one case, uh, there's a representative uh, from that case in this room, after we had a discussion about why they didn't get 100 on the first round, they changed one aspect of the way they do business. Uh, whether that was cause and effect or just the seeing the light, uh, uh, we will leave. Uh, we will uh, leave to the uh, historians. Well, as you said, here at the Peterson Institute, we're always willing to claim credit for progress <laughs> of that type because we know no one can disprove it. Um, the floor is open. <laughs> May, please, please identify and then uh, fire away. Uh, thank you, Ted. I'm Meg Lunsager at the IMF and. I was just wondering if you've looked at changing portfolio composition as you've done these uh, snapshots over time, and if you would think over time there'd be more investment in uh, emerging market developing countries given you know, my institution, the staff and management at the IMF, are projecting there'll be much better growth in those countries than there will be in the advanced economies. So what do you see looking ahead, and can you tell, can you get a sense of um, portfolio decision-making process changing over time? Well, the answer to that is, uh, for sort of answer to that is no, uh, that I haven't really looked at that aspect. Uh, and in part because uh, there isn't a lot of information. I mean, the, the funds only now uh, are providing enough information so you can do that uh, uh, systematically. There is a, uh, like everything else, so this is a four to $10 trillion opera business, right? And, uh, and uh, the busy bees in the investment banks and the uh, academies are, uh, are uh, and even the Federal Reserve are, uh, are producing uh, papers on the subject. Uh, they tend to rely on uh, uh, the public information uh, generally comes from uh, where the where a fund has taken a, a either controlling stake, which is very rare, uh, or a significant stake, uh, which is either revealed because it's required under local laws or revealed because common sense says if you're going to buy 3% of a major corporation or 5% of a major corporation, you should uh, issue a press release. Uh, issue a press release. So they're in the, they fall off, they show up in the one of the databases. Uh, but that amount is sort of a tr that's sort of a several hundred billion of the four trillion, uh, uh, and uh, the various groups have looked at sort of how things have changed. There is a sense in which they do move around over time in this literature. Uh, some more attraction towards emerging markets. Uh, uh, the Singapore funds have indicated that they publicly that they're moving that, that way. It's always a little unclear to know how much it is, this is what our intention is and this is what we're actually doing. Uh, but my simple answer is no. Uh, and I'm not so sure that there will, well, and the reasonable hypothesis is they'll go where the profits are, uh, if you want to put it that way. So in that sense, certainly uh, the more attraction towards uh, uh, emerging market economies which have a reasonable, uh, a reasonable record of uh, protecting your investments, if I may put it that way, uh, uh, is a natural thing to expect, right? So you're going to have more growth in the emerging market world uh, than in the, and in the 
traditional advanced world, right, then you would expect more, more investments in that uh, over time. Especially for there, where they're more than just, uh, more than just uh, sort of, uh, we buy a bit of everything, completely diversified. Okay. Further questions? Yes. Ali Dow Jones. Um, I'm wondering if you could explain a little bit more, elaborate on um, where the regulatory uh, arbitrage might happen. Uh, wh where would it be hidden? In subsidiaries, shell companies, shell firms, shell investments. Secondly, what, what would be the incentive for Sovereign Wealth Fund to, uh, to be more transparent and have disclosure without some sort of uh, mandatory guidelines that maybe raise uh, uh, transaction costs? Um, well, I think the principal area of regulatory arbitrage uh, and the easiest one is torch reserves. Uh, so, uh, to be perfectly frank, you have uh, you have in China the China Investment Corporation, mm -hmm. which is about $300 billion, and about half of which, uh, maybe two thirds of which is invested abroad, and half of which is, or one third is invested at home. Uh, maybe it's the other way around at this point. Uh, but it's $300 billion, right? And, uh, and the reserves of the China are $2.4 and uh, there is a investment vehicle, which is part of the safe, that is uh, incorporated, my understanding, in Hong Kong. And it's alleged to have a, uh, a balance sheet of a half a trillion dollars, bigger than the CIC. Uh, and uh, we know nothing about it. Uh, I mean, the rest of the world knows nothing about it. No, that we knows nothing about it. So the temptation is just keep it in your reserves, right? And manage it as part of your reserves, right? And uh, don't declare it as a sovereign wealth fund. Don't separate it from the rest of your reserves. There may be a whole bunch of reasons they're doing this, by the way, and it includes, and some sovereign wealth funds are included as part of the reserves, like the GIC in, in Singapore and the, and the KIC in Korea. That's partly for historical reasons. Uh, uh, which I think is actually a problem because it's not quite clear what they are. Uh, so that's the easiest way, right? You keep it in your reserves. You just do the same thing. Uh, if you're not a, if you're not a, if you're not a, a complier with the reserves template of the IMS Special Data Dissemination Standard, you actually don't even have to come close to disclosing that. Uh, uh, and there's an open question, I guess, that is how you would disclose, whether you would disclose it anyhow. Uh, this is uh, operation not uh, audited. So then that comes in some sense to the second question about the incentives. Um, uh, I think there are three incentives. One uh, incentive, uh, I think the biggest incentive actually uh, comes from uh, the domestic residents. I mean, notwithstanding the fact that uh, we like to take credit for all the progress that's been made since 2007, uh, once uh, the sovereign wealth funds burst on the international radar screen, they also burst on the national radar screen. Uh, and at home, the managers and the governments and managers of these funds came under increasing pressure to tell their general publics what they were doing. Uh, and uh, so that, so that's that was one incentive that the, at, at home to 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 both uh, tell the citizens what they're doing and tell them progressively more about what they're doing. Uh, uh, a second incentive is uh, comes from once they're part of the club is they'll get peer pressure from within the club, uh, and uh, as I described. And the third incentive, I think, comes, will come from the outside. I mean, there is a certain sense, I think, uh, that uh, if we have here or the, another Dubai ports fiasco, if I may put it that way, which was as much a failure of public relations as it was of public policy, uh, but it doesn't matter, right? If you have another fiasco like that, uh, uh, 
for whatever reason, or somewhere else, that will raise the profile again, right? And then you will have a sort of, then people will check and see, well, uh, uh, was this a fund that was doing well, or is this a fund that's not doing well on the Santiago principles or the, or the scoreboard? So I think there will be a certain sense in which uh, I would hope uh, you would do this. There's a, um, there are, there are um, a few minor competing scoreboards, if I may put it that way. Uh, 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 which I mentioned in the book, so you can go find about them. They tend to be a little more uh, political in their interpretation, if I may put it, their application of their principles, right? Uh, so, uh, so there is sort of uh, what you do absolutely, and then there is sort of uh, uh, what we actually think about your country in general. Uh, uh, and that's a general problem, actually. Uh, they, they, one of the issues, uh, I cite some research that's been done, uh, that perceptions of funds, regardless of how they score, uh, tend to be correlated with perceptions of countries. Right? So if you're, uh, if you're uh, running a fund from, a, from a, uh, a country that's well known for or is perceived as having weak governance, right? No matter how well you do, right, you're going to probably there's a perception that you're weaker. Uh, uh, you could argue a bit like the uh, inflation targeting uh, that, in some sense, uh, uh, where inflation targeting has, where central banks adopted inflation targeting, and that actually led many of the central banks that adopted it to dramatically upgrade the quality of their research and. Uh, and analysis. Uh, so there was a positive feedback loop from this sort of glomming on to this, uh, this way of doing your monetary policy to sort of actually the underlying quality of your policy. And you could argue, stretching things a bit, that though so likewise, that the sovereign wealth fund people in the country have an incentive actually to upgrade the reputation of right, their home country, right? Because that actually will help them in being able to more easily, you know, invest abroad in places they are with fewer questions asked. But Ted, as a follow-up on all this, uh, this has struck me before, but isn't there something of a moral hazard to your effort here? I mean, the more you succeed and the more you get these folks to comply with principles and stand up and be countered, uh, maybe the less incentive they have to put the money in a sovereign wealth fund, as you said, keep it in the reserves, do anything you want, don't be accountable at home or abroad. Um, no, that's what I mean. I agree. That's, that's why I'm that's worried. The that's why I worry about regulatory arbitrage. So, so, and when I started, you're absolutely right. So when I started on this, I said you really want to need to cross the board because you have the potential for regulatory arbitrage, right? But, uh, but uh, so I took only one bite at the apple. But if the consequence of this is uh, either that none of the other major countries, none of the countries who have large sovereign wealth funds join the IFSWF, right? Uh, or those countries who have, where we know, uh, basically are running sovereign wealth funds out of the reserves and they don't come out of the closet. Uh, then I think we have a problem, right? Because in some sense we have, by signing, shining the light on uh, this type of phenomenon and circumscribing what it is, right? Everybody, has the, you know, there's a tendency to escape into the shadows, uh, and that would be uh, that would be an irony and uh, and an unfortunate irony. So one would hope. That's why I think it's important, for a whole variety of reasons, to revisit the the, the reserves template uh, uh, discussions, uh, 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 part and parcel with the, the rest of this. Okay, Barry. Barry Wood, economics correspondent. Ted, uh, I'm wondering about the relative transparency of the different funds in terms of asset classes. Does it follow that uh, those countries we would associate with holding the Western principles, like, say, Norway or Canada or Britain, that they are much more transparent into as to what asset classes they have put their investments? I was uh, intrigued when you mentioned that we know something about the capital withdrawal during the economic crisis. How much do we know? 
Well, uh, much of what we know in this area is anecdotal. Uh, uh, and there are anecdotes and anecdotes, and I put it that way. Uh, 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 you asked a narrow question about uh, asset classes. Uh, I haven't looked at that. Uh, some funds, and you can find it in the appendix of Chapter 5, uh, some funds disclose quite a lot about the, the asset, the types of investments they have put their assets in, and, and the, even in the specific assets. So you can go to those and you could track the event they do it, you could track over time what, they, what they've been doing. Uh, I do have, a, I do look at the broader is, issue of, uh, of how, and there's a table 5.10 in here, and uh, about how, peop how the, the scoreboard results and the, and the transparency and accountability sub-scoreboard, and, uh, and how that scores with other indicators, right? And they, you know, there are positive correlations with, uh, this is not unique to me, but the, the Heritage Index of, uh, of Economic Freedom, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the World Bank's Ease of Doing Business, in particular, the World Bank's uh, voice and accountability subcomponent uh, of their uh, governance indicators. Um, interestingly enough, uh, although there is a positive correlation, it's not nearly as strong with uh, Transparency International's uh, significant correlation, I should say, but not nearly as strong with Transparency International's uh, Corruption Perceptions Index. And interestingly enough, uh, there's no there's a positive but not significant correlation of scores with the World Economic Forum's uh, Global Competitiveness Index. Uh, I'm not sure whether I'm doing this to grade the other indices or grade the, the grade the uh, uh, or grade the sovereign wealth of my own. I think at one level uh, these things tend to go together, as you suggested in your question, uh, but in a somewhat uh, differential, somewhat differential uh, uh, way. Okay. Jennifer? I don't know. Yes, we do. We're recording this. Um, I want to get Jennifer Harrison, U.S. State Department. Let me go back uh, to Fred's first question. Um, with what I thought I heard you saying, Fred, was that uh, there might be a criticism to be leveled against sovereign wealth funds, not on the basis of any one investment decision, but more that they're perhaps post-cyclical as such. That uh, you know, when when gas prices are, are going up like they were, some of thousand and eight, you see you know sovereign funds that are sort of oil-based siphoning you know an ever larger share off and into um, sovereign funds, and, and likewise, you see them really pulling back um, when, when the market starts to go down. But wouldn't that suggest that maybe the more relevant concern right now um, from host countries is that uh, we, should, we should be worried, if anything, not about um, you know, a CFIUS problem or two, but more about sovereign funds turning inward and, and sort of preferencing domestic investments when we live in a post-2008 world where capital is scarce. And, and becoming almost sort of uh, neo-industrial policy tools that they are giving um, state-owned enterprises, uh, you know, maybe um, uh, below market financing. Well, I think uh, I think you're. Uh, I mean, you're right, and I, I said in fact for that uh, it would seem, based upon what I understand, I haven't tried to check the numbers, that there is they are prosecuting. Um, well, cyclical in the sense that at good times they've invest more abroad, and bad times they bring the invest their home. But if oil price goes up, they're no, 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 just in, gen in general, the cycle, right? So is they're pro cyclical in the sense that they have investing more abroad, they put more into the global pool of finance, right? In the good times, right? And they took more out in the bad times. Now, for some of them, that was actually how they were set up. The copper price example. Right, so the copper price is high, they put the money abroad, and the copper price is low, they bring it in, right, in the Mexico, in Chile, and the, so in some sense, that's correct, they're pro-cyclical relative to the, their own, the world, they're counter-cyclical relative to their own circumstance. Uh, and, uh, but I think that needs, to, that needs to be recognized, so it's part of how you think the world uh, balances. I think the second point that you raised, and the third point that you raised, Jennifer, are very um, important. Uh, 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 there in all these in every country, including 
Alaska and Alberta. I mean, you, there are some quite a lot of interesting literature about Alaska and Alberta. There, I, there is a tendency to say, this is our money, we want it now. And we want it to uh, support uh, domestic development uh, or home state development, right? Uh, which tends to lead to, in, you know, uh, at a minimum, um, white elephant projects in Calgary or in Nome, if I may put it that way, right? Uh, 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 right? And, uh, and uh, and the associated issues that come with that kind of investment, it's a little more, it's a little easier to manage the corruption if you want to put it the bunch of corruption when it's an offshore investment than it's an onshore investment. Uh, the second point that you, the th sec last point that you made. So yes, the answer is yes. It's sort of once they come home, will they go back abroad, right, or will this become a nice habit? And it will, and to the extent that this has all been designed in part to deal with Dutch disease kinds of problems, you've sort of undone the, undone the process. Right, and, uh, uh, and you have net ex post, post crisis, uh, good management, good policy. Uh, the second question, uh, third question that you point that uh, you raise, I think is a, is a very complicated one for you and your colleagues, if I may put it that way. Uh, uh, to the extent a sovereign wealth fund uh, gets involved with the <clears throat> activities of uh, other uh, national champion organizations, whether they're government owned or not government owned, uh, you end up with, it seems to me, the same kinds of issues of uh, cross subsidization uh, that you have, the trade lawyers have been engaged with for decades. Uh, and, and the potential for that to go on uh, uh, and at least the accusations of subsidies uh, uh, or for this to be a disguised way of uh, enhancing control, if you want to worry about it that way, uh, I think is, uh, is real. Uh, and it's, uh, it's one reason why, I think, again, why you think you would want a, a broader approach to this. But I, I, I do worry, right? Uh, I mean, you see, I mean, in some sense, the, the news reports go that way. So it says, China wants to, uh, China should get a piece of Potash Corporation, right? In, uh, right? And so how is it going to get it? It's going to get the CIC to invest alongside it which is maybe fine in some sense, right? But you do worry a little bit about how you, how you are mobilizing the, the government funds with the private funds. Now, in the China case, since if you don't think there's any difference anyhow, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but, but in other cases, right, uh, there, there, is, there may be some differences, right? Uh, uh, I mean, depending on where you start from. Uh, uh, so I think it's, this is a, I think it is, I would not be surprised that personally that if there become at least tensions in this area for those reasons over the next couple, of, uh, next period of years. Uh, it's not an easy thing. I mean, like all subsidy kinds of cases, right? Proving blah 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 and so forth and so on. Uh, it probably is a reason for why, from the fund side, uh, of the community of fund side, one should uh, think about uh, adding certain rules and regulations and so forth and so on and guidelines and practices, right? And precisely to protect you, right? Uh, now, it may not be perceived that way from the other governments, but, you know, I think, again, to the extent that uh, you have a nice fat case like this, uh, 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 and the result was that we, in our infinite wisdom, say, right, start clamping down more hardly on sovereign wealth fund investments, right? Uh, then, then you have, uh, you know, for good or for evil, right? You have an impact on the other sovereign wealth funds, uh, and one would hope that there be some self-policing mechanism in this area. But I, uh, I know, I know that this is uh, a concern, uh, and I think it should be a concern. Okay, time for one last question. If anybody has one, yes. 
Uh, Andrew Rosnoff, Pramal. Uh, Ted, I have a question with regards to the tension that one often sees between increased levels of transparency and the efficiency of the portfolio <coughs> management. Uh, part of the reason that many of these funds were so pro-cyclical uh, in uh, buying up assets high and selling them low uh, was at least partly because they were subject to higher transparency locally, especially the newer funds, and could not withstand the public pressure of 20, 30 percent drawdowns, whereas from a purely long-term asset management perspective, this would have been the right thing to do. Um, Norway was actually counter-cyclical because it took them 10 years to get to a point where people understood what they were doing and they were buying more equities as, even as they were falling, as you remember. But even Norway, uh, when you think about it, who famously came out and said that they have a 100-year investment horizon, that they're best positioned as patient money to earn all sorts of liquidity and risk premium in the market, even for them, during the first 10 years of their existence, uh, they were invested 60% in the most liquid possible bonds and 40% of the most liquid possible equity, effectively paying for liquidity that they did not, did not need, uh, rather than earning the money for liquidity. So, uh, now, the best possible way, I suppose, for a fund manager to avoid that and start managing portfolio in the most efficient way from day one is to have non, no transparency, which is not to say have no accountability. Obviously, you're accountable to whoever the supervisory council is or the sheikh or the emir may be. But assuming that we are insisting on transparency, should we not think about taking a book out of the central banking practice? After all, we came to the conclusion that we made our central banks as independent and removed from the political process as possible, precisely because they had to make some very unpopular political decisions for the better of the uh, economy. Would it not be uh, advisable when pressing for more transparency to also combine that with a set of best recommendations or suggestions as to how countries might be able to uh, take the sovereign wealth fund out of the political process and set it up almost along the lines of independent central banks. Thank you. Well, in case you want to know everyone, this is Mr. Sovereign Wealth Fund Coiner here. Uh, asking the last question, very, you very, 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 uh, very, uh, you know, in case you want to find him and shoot him, some darts at him, right? This is his picture, and you can, uh, uh, I think those are good questions. I think it really two parts, right? Uh, one is sort of can the, can the transparency and so forth and so on be actually a negative for the fund? Uh, the answer obviously is yes, as you described, because it, uh, my sense is, in my own conversations, though you've had a lot more than I have, that most, the ones I've had with sovereign wealth managers uh, who come to me, so this is sort of self bias selection, is that they welcome it, right? Because they understand that the better they do at telling their story over the cycle, right, the better they won't convince everybody that, uh, every, that they can never lose a dime, right? But they'll at least convince a certain amount of people that, you know, these things go up and down, and this is how we manage our portfolio, and so forth and so on in this context. Uh, uh, I think, in some sense, the central bank analogy I would accept, and I, and I think that's part of why in the scoreboard stuff, and, and also in the Santiago Pencil, you want to, you want to, I mean, you have to recognize that these entities are governmental, right? But the question is how you structure their governmentalism, right? Like, do you have a, do you have a, you know, the government's appropriate the funds in some sense to generate the stuff. You might have a, a board that, uh, that sort of gives you broad strategy, right? Uh, but then you want to have a separate management that, uh, uh, that makes the actual investment decisions, right, with a reporting process, uh, including a reporting process that, uh, uh, but I would include that reporting process for the first reason, a public reporting process. Uh, you know, and that I think is broadly analogy to the, the analogous to the central bank system, right? So in this country, we have a, a law, right? We have uh, uh, we have the, which is the government. We have a the central bank is independent, and we have a reporting process in which they can. Ben Bernanke gets up, goes up there, and gets criticized at least twice a year, uh, and they have a whole pro a whole panoply of reports about what they are doing. And they still get criticized for being too opaque, uh, uh, but I think that's you know. But I think that most modern central bankers, contrary in contrast to where they were 20 years ago, even 
I think are much more comfortable with that way of doing things than they were before, and I think it's a pretty good analogy. I did not think, you know, you're never going to be completely apolitical. Um, and uh, if I can, uh, I was going to end on a provocative note. Do you want me to end on a provocative note? <laughs> Absolutely. So, um, and I don't mean this as a critical criticism, but I may mean it as sort of a description of, of the reality. When this whole process of setting up the sovereign wealth, the, the, what led to the Santiago Principle started, the idea was suggested by the Treasury that it involve uh, equally the fund and the bank, for example, in particular, there's a question about the OECD too. Um, the bank chose not to be involved other than as an observer. And uh, the reason that I was told, on reasonably good authority, was that the bank had its own dealings with many of these investors, governments as investors. And they said, we don't want to be in the business of criticizing the people who we are clients. Uh, now, I think that was a rather, personally think that was rather narrow-minded and not really consistent with the public good dimension of the World Bank's activities. Uh, 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 but it's understandable. The incentives were set up that way, <laughs> and that's the way they, they, were, they, they, way they went. Um, so there are, as I say, there are issues going both, both ways, and uh, about, I think, on balance, and I want to say that, I think on balance we are at a much better, whether, how much of the how much more than 50% of the credit we could take, Fred, I don't know, but I think we're in a lot better position in this situation than we were probably three years ago. Ted, thank you for your enormous contribution to this. Thank you also for all the other issues you've done yeoman work on. I might mention, I intended to at the start, Ted has a new op-ed on a different piece in the FT online op-ed series uh, from yesterday. That has to do with U.S. gold policy, so you can refer to that if you're interested in that. I'll give him another plug. Uh, but thanks to you very much for the work on sovereign wealth funds. Thanks to all for coming. Meeting adjourned.